Hello chaps and chapesses, and welcome to 2020. And in this week's video, we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, how to catch giant trevally on a fly. When my mind visualizes the pristine wilderness of the flats, there is one species that I see marauding across it, and that is the giant trevally. It's become an obsession of mine, I freely admit it. I've been chasing these things around the globe since about 2001, 2002, and for me, they've become a complete passion. A couple of years ago, I was mad enough to actually sit down and try and put all of these thoughts onto paper, and I came up with this. GT, A Fly Fisher's Guide to Giant Trevally. Writing this book was an incredible experience of learning and also gleaning information from those who knew far more about the subject than I did. And if you're interested in having a look at this book, then I will leave a link to it in the description below. Why are GTs so beguiling? For me, I think it's their just incredible pugnacious nature. Some people say they're just incredibly easy to catch. I don't entirely believe that. There are situations where they can be just as finicky as a permit. But for me, the obsession began in the early 2000s when I encountered my first GT on Alphonse. And it's the first time that I came out of my comfort zone on the flats and started wading around in thigh depth water, which on the surf line can be quite a nerve wracking experience because there are far larger and teethier things that swim along those edges than just GTs. No one told me at that point that if I saw a shark these days, I'd be running towards it instead of running away with it. I would have told them to stop being so utterly ridiculous. But these days, that's probably the case. Quite often GTs like to hang around those, but we'll talk about that more later. They're aggressive, they're opportunistic, they'll feed on any large food source that they can find nearby, whether that's going to be packs of bait fish which they can corral into the shadows, or as most of you will have seen that phenomenal footage of GTs eating birds on Farqua Atoll, which still to this day slightly blows my mind. I was lucky enough to see that with my own eyes, and it is a true sight to behold. The thing about them that I think captivates me so much is their sheer power. Nothing will quite prepare you for hooking into a giant trevally on a fly. It'll give some blue water fish a real run for their money. But also we can hunt them in shallow water. So just like your bonefish, you can hunt them in very skinny water because they'll come right up onto the flats to hunt their prey. And in that environment, there can be no other fish which is as exciting to chase on a fly rod. Where do we find GTs? Well, at the moment, they mostly populate the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean regions. So they'll come right up through the African coastline, up through Mozambique, Madagascar, South Africa, that area up there, all the way up through the Red Sea, uh, the Sudan, uh, the Nubian Flats, a phenomenal destination for GTs, down into Oman, and up right round through the Maldives. You will find them in numbers, and then also up to the Andamans and down the Indonesian coastline. From there, they then spread out right across the Pacific, and you'll find GTs marauding desolated islands in the middle of the Pacific, which one day we will almost certainly have to go and explore. They've got a pretty large range, and these GTs behave pretty much the same way, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. The hard part is finding a flats environment to chase them on. We can find them in deep water easy enough, but trying to find them in an area where they'll come up onto the shallow flats that you can hunt them on foot, that's the challenge. And there's not that many places around the world where you can actually do that. The most famous is obviously the Seychelles where there are prolific numbers of GTs on numerous atolls, most of which I've had the opportunity to go and fish. But also you will find them right across into the Pacific, as I said before, and Christmas Island in the Pacific at Kiribati is probably one of the most famous ones. And one of the areas that GT fishing first came to light on a fly. Those early pioneers who were happily fishing away across flats looking for bonefish and suddenly a giant thing came streaking out of the deep water and smashed their bonefish and took it away from them. It must have been a little bit of a baptism of fire, but one I would have loved to have witnessed. As a food source, GTs will hunt pretty much anything, but their faves are baitfish, mullet, bonefish, um, a lot of coral species, parrotfish, wrasse, bigger bonefish, but they'll hunt pretty much anything. But they are also capable of tuning into the cyclical nature of certain things that happen in our world, such as the sooty terns when they are hatching all of their young on these atolls. And also things like 
when the turtles are hatching, which is a very sad thing to see, all these wonderful little turtles which are trying to get out of the sea. And I'm afraid quite often the GTs will gang up and they'll just eat them as they hit the water. But they will eat so many different species. And the most important thing to think of is where their natural food source will be, and that is how you will locate them on these atolls. So if you haven't been GT fishing on the fly before, there's a few things that you need to take into consideration. This is not the territory for eight, nine, and 10 weights. This is the territory for 11 and 12 weight fly rods. You're gonna need every single ounce of power that you can get out of modern carbon fiber technology. And almost certainly, often the GT will win. There will be tackle failure. There will be explosions of lines. There will be explosions of rods. Occasionally, there is explosions of anglers. They take absolutely no mercy in the way that they fight. So from that perspective, you must have the best tackle that you can afford. Starting with rods, nine foot 12 weight, nine foot 11 weight are your kind of standard staple weapons of choice. I like to use an 11 weight on the flats just because it's actually easier to cast lines all day than it is lumping around a great big 12 weight. And an 11 weight these days with modern rod technology, you will find that it'll have more than enough power to subdue a very large GT on a flats environment. The only time that this really is not the case is if you are going to be hunting along a surf line. The surf line is not a natural environment for a fly fisher. When you are wading up to your waist through coral bombies and the surf is trying to crash over your head, but that is where the GTs will first find their way onto the atolls and that's the first place that you need to intercept them. But if you're going to fish in those environments, a 12 weight is exactly what you need because you've got to be able to stop those fish before they hit the reef edge or otherwise your fly line is going to get cut straight on the coral and that fish is going to disappear with a lot of your tackle, terminal tackle, fly and probably your heart. When it comes to rods these days my weapons of choice are the Hardy Zephyrus range. I'm particularly fond of these because they don't break. I know that I can apply maximum pressure on them and I haven't had one fail on me. So I have full confidence in that. There are loads of different brands, everybody has their favorites, Sage, Loomis, any of those top end brands will get the job done. Reels are more important. Having an incredibly powerful drag on your reel is going to be the difference between success and failure. There are so many different reel manufacturers out there that almost micro-engineer reels and you are about to throw one of these fly reels into the harshest environment that a fly reel could ever be thrown into. Salt water, in the surf, submerged, probably covered in grit. So you've got to make sure that you have confidence in your reel. I like ones which have got a large arbor on them, which I can then put on 350 to 400 yards of 80 pound braid as backing. And I like, also like a reel which has a regulator that I can turn from zero drag to full drag in one turn of my hand. The last thing I want to be doing when I'm fighting one of these creatures is to be frantically turning the knob to make sure that I've got enough drag to try and stop it before it heads off the flat. My choice, Stick with what you know, Hardy Fortuna XDS. It's one of my favorite reels, though there are many other, again, reels which will do the jobs. Things like T-Bore Pacifics, Able Super Series, Wade Reels, Shilton Reels. I touched on backing briefly. I like to use Spinning Braid as backing for GT Reels. Um, I will leave a link up here to how I set these up. Just a big bimini twist with a loop on the end, I find is the best way to then attach it to the fly line. Almost don't overthink the braid. What a lot of people think is that they must have top quality spinning braid. Actually, the cheaper stuff is better because it's thicker. And that means that it's less likely to cut into your fingers if that fish gets wrapped. And it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you're using it as backing. It's just much better than using either GSP, which is too thin, or to use Dacron, which is simply not abrasion resistant enough. Make sure you put the backing on with a line winder. It needs to be put on really tight because otherwise it'll cut into itself when the fish is running and that will result in end of the story, which should make you cry. Fly lines were always a bit of a challenge to begin with because we didn't have them in those days which had 50 pound cores. These days, most serious tarpon lines and there are specific GT lines now which have got 50 pound mono cores in them and these are the lines that you want to be using. Lines like uh, the Rio GT, the Cortland GT stroke Bluefin, um, I quite like the Rio Tarpon, and there are, again, horses for courses, what tapers you like, but you've just got to make sure that it's got that 50 pound core on it. I'm afraid I don't trust factory loops, I cut those off and I switch those out with braided loops. Um, here's another little video of how I do that. 
and I then aqua seal those onto the fly line which I find is actually a stronger connection than the fly line itself. Then you have a quick system which you can loop to loop onto your backing, you can put the reel through the big backing loop that you make and you can also carry spare lines on boxes or whatever in your backpack it means you can change out a line very quickly if you get cut on the coral. Working our way up to the business end, there's nothing sexy and there's nothing complicated about using leaders for GTs. Level 100 to 130 pound mono, that is it. You just want a big loop in one end that goes on your braided loop and then a number of different knots can be used like perfections um, to put your fly on. You want to fish your fly on a loop so it can swim properly but it's not about strength per se, it's about abrasion resistance because the GTs will fling your kit all the way through every coral head they can find and it's literally to prevent you losing your fish because the leader material has been chowed through a coral head. So those of you who want to fish IGFA regulation, feel free to do so. I wouldn't recommend it on your head beard. Then let's have a quick chat about flies. Flies are pretty cool when it comes to GTs. Big bait fish patterns, Mr. Charlie chickens, all about six inches long. Uh, there's a, lots of different patterns which are very successful these days and most of them will be tied on either 6.0 or 4.0 hooks. You've got to make sure that you're using top quality hooks. Cheap hooks will just break or bend. Uh, the amount of pressure that you are going to apply on these things, it's got to be a proper anchor which is going to hold securely in that fish's mouth. There's nothing pretty about this game. Always make sure that you crimp down the barbs. Always use a barbless hook so that the fish can be returned as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. My favorite patterns are things like the standard brush flies uh, in tan and black. I'm very fond of a new pattern called the gym sock which has got a slightly bulgy profile but doesn't have too much weight to it. And then there's the magnetic minnow, there's the flaming Lamborghini, uh, there's the olive sempers and tan sempers which you shouldn't go anywhere in the world without because they're just a really good mobile pattern for GTs and any number of shrimp and other small crab patterns will also work. They're very, very opportunistic, as I said earlier. When you are finding GTs on rays, for example, when they're actually cruising around the flats, that is the time when you want to be using maybe slightly smaller flies. Uh, crab patterns can work. Even just a plain tan clouser can be extremely successful. And when you are storing GT flies, the best way to do that is to use the wallets which have got the plastic dividers inside and each one is like a little Ziploc bag. You can fit far more patterns into these which will not then get crushed but are also more importantly waterproof because the last thing you want is all of your flies getting wet because basically you're going to ruin most of them. It also takes up far less space in your backpack and is a much better use for carrying your flies. Over the years I've developed various systems that I like to use on the flats and what kit I like to take. Light is good, at the end of the day you're going to spend a lot of time waiting around and you're going to have to carry most of this stuff in a backpack. So starting at the top, uh, Polaroids, there's no point in going to any serious international fishing destination if you don't have a decent pair of Polaroids. And in the case of GT fishing I like the either green mirror or blue, blue mirror finish. Uh, blue mirror is probably better in very very bright sunshine the green mirror is a very very good all-round lens and then i always carry a set of sunrise lenses in my backpack if you get really bad visibility this can make an enormous difference there is a number of times when it's very very flat light or gray and overcast and you can see fish with those sunrise lenses that you would otherwise not see moving down you must have some kind of buff uh, which you can cover your face with at the end of the day you're going to be spending a lot of time wading on the water, you're very low down and if you've got bright sunshine you do get fried. I like the shirts which have got the buff built into, uh, mine are made by Gilt and uh, they are a phenomenal shirt to wear on, on the flats and in this situation and I like them because they have a breath mask in the middle and that stops me fogging up my glasses. They've also got little vents on the side which I find help keep my neck cool in the real heat. Then we look at shorts and trouser configurations if you're going to be doing a lot of wading i would highly recommend that you wear lycra cycling shorts underneath your shorts this prevents chafe if you're going to spend a lot of time submerged in the water you can find that you will get sores on the inside of your legs which can be extremely painful by the end of a week's fishing the lycra will help you with that i've taken that one step further these days and tend to wear full lycra tights i know it looks a bit odd but i do find that it protects my legs 
and also you don't have that situation of having to drag heavy material through the water. So if you're wearing long trousers for example, the drag on those over a long walk can actually be quite exhausting. Then we're down to gravel guards and socks. My favourite these days is the Sims all-in-one gravel guard and neoprene uh, sock combination. That just makes life so easy. You just whack on the sock, throw the boot on and put the gravel guard down over the top. And I've also found in destinations like Nubian Flats in Sudan where it's quite corally on the edges, those neoprene cuffs around my ankles will afford an enormous amount of protection and stop me getting nicked um, on the coral. Then we talk about boots. Boots, most of the situations where you're going to be fishing for Giant Trevally, you're going to be in a very harsh coral environment. And so therefore you need really, really good boots. There's a number of brands, again, whichever one that you like to use. I wouldn't go anything less than something like a Sims flat sneaker. And if you do these trips fairly regularly, you want the toughest boots you can get. I like the Sims Vapor Tread, which I will also leave a quick link on the ones that I use. Um, and I think Patagonia have just come out with a new boot with Dana, which looks very, very interesting, really tough, and you need lots of ankle support. So don't go to the Seychelles or one of these destinations with a little pair of neoprene booties because you're going to come back with no feet. Then we come to organization. Most GT fishermen like one backpack. You don't want anything around your waist. You don't want anything which could catch fly lines as you're wading around. One backpack, a waterproof backpack is the way to go. And on that, some kind of system where you can carry a second rod, uh, which is fully made up. Again, here's another little video on how I put that one together. And when it comes to organizing all of that stuff, I'm not going to go into huge detail. Um, and here's another little video. I know this seems to be a bit of a recurring theme, um, which will show you how to organize all of your kit on the flats. We've got all our kit, we're headed out onto the flats. Now what do we do? Well, the first thing you want to do is listen to your guide because your guide is going to take you to the best place. However, let's talk about the cycle of GT's feeding and how it all works, um, incorporating a bit of tidal structure. So GT's will hang around the edges of the reefs, say for example you're fishing an atoll or something like that. They maraud up and down looking for bait fish to be swept over the edge that they can then annihilate but they're waiting for tidal depth for them to creep up onto the shallower water onto the flats where they can then start to hunt. Like a lot of big predatory species, the GTs will be some of the very, very first to cruise up on, and they literally come out in the earliest stages of that tide. So at the bottom of the tide, you'll find them around rock pinnacles and offshore structures, anywhere where there's a bit of melee of current, which is gonna knock fish off balance. So the first potential place that we can target these fish is there, and that will probably have to be from a boat. The next stage is the surf line, which is possibly one of the most exciting places to hunt GTs. So this is our first point of interception. This will require you to get out of a boat, wade into the surf line, and there is nothing quite like watching that surf roll up and looking at it as if it's a window, and then you'll see fish literally shooting down the inside of the waves. It's one of the most exciting things you can ever see. And at that point, you've got a really good chance of intercepting them because they're coming onto the flats and they're hungry. Hooking fish and playing fish in the surf is no joke, but it is an enormous amount of fun. And this is probably one of the things I love most about GT fishing. As the tide comes up, you will then find that they will move into the channels and a bit like the levains on a leaf, which I've used as a description before, they will then use that network of channels to move their way up onto the flats when the water reaches a certain depth. And the ideal depth for, gi for giant trevally fishing in general is probably going to be knee to thigh depth. Water temperature is very important. They don't like hot, hot water, although you will occasionally find them marauding in the back of lagoons. They are very hardy fish, but generally speaking, you want a cooler temperature. Um, you want that fresh water coming onto the flats and that's gonna be their ideal hunting environment. So as they find their way up onto the flats, that's when they start looking at different structures such as little raised areas of sand in the middle of flats which can be somewhere where the bait fish can huddle and hide. So that is obviously what they're after. They're going to find packs of bait, packs of food which they can then corral and you will sometimes find them smashing into bait and pushing the fish up onto the beach and I've even seen GTs literally flop on their side almost out of the water trying to get these bait fish. Other big areas of flats, you'll find them in channels which are used to cross from one area to another. We call these GT highways. 
and you will find a deeper area of water which links two big drainage systems and that's a great place to sometimes stake out and see if you can actually wait for a while and see if the fish are crossing. Don't be afraid to spend time actually waiting as well. A lot of people when they're GT fishing they're very impatient, they want to get out, they want to hunt, they want to move around. Sometimes a little patience and actually just staking out an area that you know that they're going to come to can often prove successful. As the tide then moves up on through the flats and into the lagoon system, the fish will then push into the lagoons and you will often find them right up against the edges, cruising against the margins and looking for any form of prey which is unsuspecting. Areas of turbulent current can often be quite good because they like to hunt underneath that, so quite often you will find them hanging underneath the current which is being pushed off the edges of the flats on the lagoon side, but anywhere where they think that they can get a quick and easy meal, that's quite often where you're going to find them congregating. So things like coral islands, overhanging structure, rips, seams, anywhere like that you're going to most likely encounter them. When you're wading the flats, the things you need to be looking for are sign. You're looking for fins, you're looking for bow waves, particularly quite often on a flat calm you will see that fish. It's a big fish after all, pushing water and that can be extremely exciting as well. And the other thing you are looking for when wading across flats is particularly rays. GTs have a lovely relationship with rays and quite often you will find them hanging on the back of a ray and quite often they'll go very dark, they'll blend in with the, with the ray and that is a brilliant area to try and intercept them because if you, if you see a ray it's always worth having a cast and a bit like permit in some ways they are waiting for bait and shrimp and crustaceans to be frightened up by the ray as it feeds and then as soon as something happens they're straight down and they'll absolutely have it. So quite often if you find a fish which is happily feeding on a ray and you put that fly in straight away, just to one side perhaps, the fish will hit it straight away. The same goes funny enough for sharks. Big sharks will often attract a pack of GTs which will hunt around the back of them in the same way a shark will move across the flats and frighten bait fish which the GTs can then hit hard. Sometimes that can reverse its situation. Um, I have seen that once or twice, in fact actually once I saw a small shark following a very big GT which was rather weird. Another great area to find trevally species is around bommies and coral heads. Now this can be a bit testing because you know full well that if you hook one you're going to be in for a serious fight, you're going to have to try and get it away from the coral head before it cuts you off, but they are a great place for them to hang around, especially on the inside of lagoons. So the expression bommy bashing is one of the ones that we use and that is where you will cast flies um, blind around the edge of coral heads, probably using poppers or yaps or something like that and hopefully you will draw a fish out if it's hanging around there. Quite often it happens immediately, they are a pretty aggressive fish but that can also be extremely exciting. When you are wading across the flats it can be very useful to have some kind of vantage point Quite often what we do is we put one person up on a boat while the others will hang around it and one will push and that gives you a little bit of vantage point across a huge area of flats or ideally if you've got a polling platform that's phenomenal, give you some height and advantage. Alternatively you're hunting around coral islands and structures like that then you can actually see from above and that can also give you a great spot. Okay, so you've seen a fish, it's hanging off the edge of the ray or it's cruising along the edge of the margin, what do you do? One of the things I always see with GT fishermen is they are not ready. You need to be ready to make that shot all the time. Those people who catch more fish are those people who are, have the ability to convert the opportunities. Ideally, you want to be able to put that cast in and quickly, quickly is the key. Fish do not hang around, they're moving very quickly, so you need to be able to capitalize on that opportunity. So, the fish is moving from right to left, you want to be able to put a, a decent sized cast out you want at least two or three feet leading the fish and you want the angle of the fly to be coming away from the fish. Predators do not like prey attacking them, it's one of those things that they just don't really get and it looks very unnatural and therefore they tend to shy away from that kind of thing. So you drop the fly down, you want to make sure that you allow the fly time to sink. So many people don't do that and they end up pulling the pattern across the surface and the fish doesn't see it. You need to let it sink down a little bit so it gets to eye level and then one slow long pull and that is normally enough for the fish to clue on to what's happening 
and you will see its posture change and then it can be interested. If you see that fins begin to move and it begins to move towards the direction of the fly, maintain your strip and always make sure that you've got the rod out in front of you because if you miss a strip you can actually pull the rod physically backwards and that will allow you to continue to retrieve because as soon as that fish sees that the fish is no longer running away from it, it loses interest and it'll move off. Obviously that's not always the case, but it can be the case. So maintain your strip, keep that rod out in front, and you can always speed up that strip. And you want a good foot and a half to two foot length strip, and you want to maintain that speed, and if the fish chases, normally these fish hit it so fast and hard, that actually you don't really have a chance to do that much. I've seen anglers drop flies 20 feet away and a fish has charged it and hit the fly before the anglers even had a chance to actually get their line sorted out. So they can move at lightning speed when they want to. So as you're maintaining that strip, what will happen is the fish will come up and it'll hit the fly. At that point, you want to strip set really hard, one long strip set, make sure that you've got it hooked and then you need to maintain the control. If the fish comes so close to you that it's almost at the rod tip, that's when you have the chance to bring the rod towards you. And you can also take steps backwards to keep that fish following until it hooks. Once you've hooked it, make sure that you clear all your line. You don't want any of that line getting hooked around your reel or your pack or anything else that's hanging around the side of your body. You need to clear it as quickly as possible and guide it through the ring. So what I tend to do is I make a loop with my hands up here, hold the rod up here, at an angle, I'm not pointing it straight in the air, you need to be able to keep it in an angle, and then as that line clears, I let it come up, come to here, it's on the reel, and then I can actually put it into my hip and I can start applying pressure. At this point, lean into the fish and use the full curvature of the blank. No trout setting, none of this high sticking stuff, because you're not using the power that's actually in the blank. So you need to lean back and you need to apply maximum pressure as that fish runs away. There's a, another little video I'll point you to here, which is how to fight big fish on a fly rod. When you're fighting a GT, you want to use as many of the angles as you possibly can. You need to constantly knock it off balance. If you allow it to, it'll just swim around you in big circles and it'll use its body weight against current to actually just go round and round and round and round. You've got to apply a lot of pressure. The faster you get that fish in, the faster you can let it go. Once you've battled that fish in closer, you can actually get to a point where you can grab the leader. Make sure that you've got line out of your tip and make sure that you are not applying that kind of pressure on your rod tip, or otherwise you're gonna find you're gonna snap your rod. If you have a guide, so much the better. You will need a glove to tail these fish. They've got very sharp scoots on the back of their tail and you need to be aware of that. Once you've got them and you've grabbed the tail, the battle is over. Normally they'll lie on their side and they'll be relatively docile and you can quickly get the hook out. If that fish has taken the fly quite a long way back, sometimes the best way to do it is actually to cut the leader and then pull the fly out backwards through the side of the gill cover. But you need to be very, very careful about this. It's best if you let the guide do it for you. So, you have battled your fish, you have survived tackle breakages, you've been covered in surf line, you have landed a GT, you have achieved greatness, you will find that this sadly is an extremely addictive experience and you will just want to go and recreate it again. I have currently been doing this for about 20 years and I still get a massive, massive kick out of it. Someone asked me the other day if you have to be the world's greatest caster to go GT fishing and the answer is no. You don't need to be able to throw out a 45 yard line with a 12 weight and Charlie Chicken. It helps. It helps to maximize your opportunities but it's not entirely necessary. You do need to be proficient and you need to be used to using the bigger line weight. So I would recommend if you're going to go and do this, you're going to go and practice. You need to be able to chuck at least 20 yards. I would say that is a safe state and you also need to be able to backhand cast with a 12 weight. It's very, very important to be able to maximize those opportunities which I've highlighted over and over again. So the more arrows in your quiver, the more likely you are to succeed. Well, as always, I hope you found that video useful. If you want to know a lot more about GT fishing on the fly, then I would give myself a shameless plug and maybe you might go and check out my book. But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this and I will look forward to seeing you on the next one.